All right, so since it's 7.31, I'm gonna get started. Um, so I wanted to say welcome everyone and thank you so much for attending um, our event in which we are recognizing the pioneers of African descent that were featured in the Afrocentric Social Work book. Um, my name is Kaeja Benton and I'm gonna be the moderator for tonight's event. Um, before I get started though, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, as we celebrate the work of our elders, I also want to bring honor to the members of African Nova Scotian communities who have gone before us, sorry, who've gone before us and who've not only made valuable contributions to the development of Canada, um, but have paved the way for the generations that come after them. And I am truly thankful. I also want to say, um, give a big thanks to the Canadian Association of Social Workers for collaborating with um, the Association of Black Social Workers on this event um, and for providing such tremendous support um, in planning this event. I don't know what I would have done without Sally and Alex, so I want to say thanks. Um, and before I go on, I just want to introduce myself really quick. So I'm a social worker working um, with the Nova Scotia Health Cole Harbor Community Mental Health and Addictions Clinic, and I'm also an active member of ABSW and um, actually the co-chair of the student group, which was actually how I got to be here tonight, which I'm thankful for. Um, so we have, tonight we have um, some inform informative events planned, and we're excited for all of you to be here to celebrate the pioneers who have paved the way for us in the social work field. Um, and furthermore, we are honored to have the um, the pioneers and their families who were featured in the Afrocentric Social Work book. So next we will hear from Rachel Sweeting, who is the Vice President of the Association of Black Social Workers to give some remarks. So Rachel. Hi everybody. Good evening. And for those who don't know me, my name is Rachel Sweeting and I am a social worker and I'm currently the Acting President of the Association of Black Social Workers. I'm very grateful to be here in the presence of social work pioneers this evening, and I'm thankful for all the contributions that they've provided. Um, when I think of pioneers specifically, um, with respect to ABSW, it all began, you know, with just four women, you know, back in the 1970s, uh, who had one vision to transform a system that was not responsive to the African Nova Scotians and their needs. And their goal was to break barriers and to put the needs of African Nova Scotian in the community at the forefront. And, you know, this ultimately set the foundation and really began those building blocks uh, for what the organization is today. And I'll say that the commitment that these, you know, four women demonstrated, and if you think about it, the immense responsibility that they felt for the African, you know, the people of African descent, it really shows their drive and determination to make long-term change within the system. And so today, ABSW and its membership continue to hold government agencies accountable for decisions and practices that impact the ANS community. And we do continue to dedicate our time um, to educate and support and bring awareness to ongoing systemic issues um, that impact the well-being of African Nova Scotians. And given that this organization was built upon volunteer work, it's really clear that our members understand that if we're not going to continue to build on um, the important work that has been started, uh, we're failing to carry out the vision that has been appropriated for the organization and the betterment of the community and our people. So when I think about passing the torch, you know, I'm grateful myself for the contributions um, the pioneers of ABSW have passed on to me in my current role, uh, learning from them um, within this organization. And I look forward to passing on uh, the torch to um, generations behind me. And I feel that as a collective, uh, ABSW will continue to carry on the legacy and values of those four women, the founding members um, for generations to come. So Kayej, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachelle, for coming and for giving those remarks. Um, and next we're going to have Sally Guy, who is the Director of Policy and Strategy for the Canadian Association of uh, Social Workers. So Sally. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sally. Um, at the very outset, I need to say that the CSW president, Joan Davis Wellen, she was supposed to be here tonight to provide some remarks. She really wishes she could be. Unfortunately, she's under the weather. 
So I am very honored um, to be here on her behalf and be here on behalf of the Canadian Association of Social Workers to, to offer some remarks and a, and a greeting. Um, we're so pleased to be here to support this important dialogue and to celebrate the pioneers' critical contributions to our profession. I do need to acknowledge that CSW's national office and where I'm speaking to you from um, is situated on land now called Ottawa, which is, of course, the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. So uh, personally, also, I I'm honored to have the opportunity to listen and learn from the speakers this evening, uh, have a chance to celebrate Black Canadians and especially Black women's uh, seminal work in the field of social work. This feels like history in action. Um, it's very cool to effectively watch the torch being passed uh, to the next generation. Um, and we're just, I'm just so happy to be here to help support it. I need to also say a thank you to the Association of Black Social Workers, Senator Thomas Bernard uh, and Kai Benton, who I've actually had the real pleasure of getting to know a little bit over the last little while uh, for putting this together and to all the speakers I'm excited to hear from. I, I am sure that the, the teachings, the knowledge, the conversations from this evening uh, will continue to inspire current and future generations of Black social workers and, and allies. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sally, for that. Um, so next, we're going to have Dr. Dolores Mullings, um, who will provide some remarks underlying the chapter three in the Afrocentric book, um, which focuses on the 15 pioneers. So Dr. Mullins. Hello, greetings, family and friends. It is my pleasure to be here with you tonight as we celebrate and honor our social work Black pioneers, some of whom have gone on to an, another plane and others who remain with us. And as the ABSW book title says, still fighting for change. I honor you pioneers and your family and thank you so much for the work that you've done. Before the manuscripts for our edited book that was published in 2021, Afrocentric Social Work, came across my screen, I had no idea about African Nova Scotians, Black pioneers, social work pioneers. Imagine my pride and some mingling of surprise when I read those pages. They're still buried in my soul and I'm so grateful. Of course, as a person of African Jamaican heritage, I knew a little bit about Rosemary Brown, one of the pioneers, but I had no idea about the others. And I've been so privileged to get to know a little bit about them through the pages of narrative. And here is yet another example of why it is important that we write our own stories and histories. We cannot depend on others to write the wrongs of history and certainly not black history. And we cannot wait on others to do or to lead the charge to manifest what we want to see in our society and our communities. Our pioneers did that and set the stage for us. So in 2011, the book 100 Years of Social Work, A History of the Profession of English Canada, 1900 to 2000, was published by a highly regarded social work scholar. There's very little evidence that Black people existed in Canada, let alone Black people who were practicing social work. Imagine our pioneers were completely erased. But today, we shed a light on our ABSW pioneers, though small in numbers. My granny would say, them did little, but them did palawa, which means that they were small but mighty. That's just the Jamaican coming out. They laid the foundation for an unrivaled legacy, untouchable. So when you read the narratives of our social work pioneer leaders who continue to inspire you and I and our children and our children's children, you cannot help but be proud. Let us hold our pioneers, some of them who are here again, as I said, with us in our hearts, shield their work, and memories and ensure that no one ever can erase them again. With this book, 
And this event, social work injustice is exposed and racial justice and specifically black racial justice is beginning to take shape. Let us hold on to that and hold on to our pioneers, our ABSW African Nova Scotian pioneers and never let go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mullins, for those wonderful remarks. Um, we're very grateful to have you here and have you um, participate in the segment. Um, so next, we are pleased to have Damini Awoija, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Damini, um, who will provide us with some spoken words, one of her pieces. So before we get started, though, I'm going to just introduce Damini um, because she's pretty cool and um, her bio she was able to send me a bio. So Damini is a 14 year old um, grade nine student from Hammonds Plains, Nova Scotia. Um, she's an activist, a writer, spoken word poet, fashion designer, entrepreneur, singer, and alt illustrator. Damini is a founder of the first Afro indigenous book club in Atlantic Canada, a book club she created to encourage young people to read books written by black and indigenous authors and to share the realities and the experiences of Black and Indigenous Canadians. Damini was the junior artist in residence for Wellness Within, um, a community organization working for reproductive justice, prison abolition, and health equity. She was also a youth ambassador for the, digi the digitally lit, a youth-led uh, strategy that aims to empower young Atlantic Canadians. She has used digital Digitally, sorry, digitally lit social media to create a campaign for accessibility awareness in built spaces. Damini is the youth entrepreneur behind Damini's Creatives, a mask and fashion enterprise that she launched in the middle of the 2020 pandemic. She made headlines in her 20 in 2020 with her bright, colorful, and vibrant African fabric masks. Also, as a spoken word poet for the past four years. Damini loves to write and perform spoken word poems to bring attention to racial injustice, gender inequality, and other issues that she cares deeply about. Um, so you can find Damini on Instagram. Her handle is at Damini.Awoeja. Sorry, Damini. Um, she's also on Twitter and she also has a website. So I'm going to put that in the chat um, just in case folks would like to visit that. So without further ado, we'll ask Damini to go ahead. So I hope you guys can hear me. Um, hi, my name is Damini Awoyiga, and this I will be reading my poem, Black Social Work Pioneers. So um, it's a really big honor for me to be able to um, share my spoken word poem here at this event today. And I wish to thank Senator Dr. Wanda Thomas Bernard um, and the Association of Black Social Workers for this kind invitation. And social workers are really dear to me, especially because my mom is a social worker. And the title of my poem, as I said before, is Black Social Work Pioneers. And it is written in honor of Black social work elders who have gone before to pave the way for other Black social workers. So here it is. Black Social Work Pioneers. The root of Black social workers on the family tree, they created a strong foundation for fruits that were yet to be each root, telling stories of the vulnerable, telling stories of the oppressed, telling stories of resilience and perseverance, patriarchs and matriarchs, unsung heroes, soldiers of great sacrifice, setting aside their own needs to take care of others. Black social work pioneers are beacons of light, guiding people towards help and care. They empower hidden voices to fight for social injustice. They are an oasis of hope, bringing parched people water when they wallowed in deserts of despair. Black social work pioneers, holders of history and time, given the power to ponder and publish their words of wisdom, show a career of gathered knowledge. Black social work pioneers teach us the importance of connection, emotion, and care. Their hearts, torches of fire that never stop burning each of their hearts showing the full capacity of their love, their souls full, deep with the depths of wells, drawing on words, grounded in ethics, 
values and important beliefs. They help us see possibilities past hardships, past traumas, teaching us to navigate and acknowledge our grief, being the medium through which support is given. They are the listening ear that people and communities need. Black social work pioneer chose to care for others, guided by, guided by the words that they give. They are the ones that give. They are the patriarchs and matriarchs of social work. Thank you so much for that. That was amazing. Um, so we're, we're now going to move into our next segment of the event, um, where we will focus on the impact and legacy of the pioneers. Um, so I'm going to ask Mrs. Grant to read the bios of the speakers, please. Sorry, trying to get off mute. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, introduce the speakers. And I will start with uh, Kaeja. Kaeja has shared a little bit about um, who she is, but I'll just sort of continue to read um, her bio. So Kaeja Benton was born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia and graduated from Dalhousie University with both the Bachelor's of Science and Recreation and a Bachelor of Social Work. Kaeja is a social work candidate and currently works with the community outreach um, as a community outreach worker with Nova Scotia Health within the community health and addictions, and is excited to start more conversations of providing better mental health and addiction services to individuals from marginalized populations. Kaeja plans to uh, begin her own private practice in the future and um, hoping to provide a service to individuals of African descent. Her goal is to respectfully advocate for more services to be available to individuals from marginalized populations and challenges for colleagues and friends to educate themselves on how to effectively work with individuals who are racialized. Furthermore, Kaeja is an active member of the Association of Black Social Workers and currently is a co-chair of the Housing Student Group Committee. She has also volunteered with the Iona Stoddard Municipal Election and is a strong, has a strong passion for helping others and excited to embark on a new career as a social worker. She is proud, she's a proud and loving sister, an amazing auntie to her nephew who just turned two, is patiently awaiting the arrival of her niece and will be getting her master's of social work degree in September. Next, we have Jerisa Jones. Jerisa is a young African Nova Scotian woman from the historical African Nova Scotia community of Upper Hammonds Plains. Her passions are working with children and youth in care and volunteering on various committees. She is currently employed as a youth counselor with the Department of Community Services and is a part-time student enrolled in the Bachelor of Social Work program at Dalhousie University. Apart from the Upper Hammonds Plains Community Development Association that supports community program and services for the residents of Upper Hammonds Plains. She has been a part of putting together events for seniors, planning the annual candidate events, fundraising initiatives, and hosting important meetings. Since 2019, Jerisa has been a member of the Road to Economic Prosperity Advisory Committee for African Nova Scotia Communities and is the co-chair of the Education Entrepreneur and Employment Subcommittee. The African proverb Abutu states, I am only because we are, and represents to Jerisa the importance of community. The only reason she has been able to strive today is because of the relationship she has within her community. Without the support of her community and family, she believes she would have not been able to be where she is today. Also, we have Afalaki Awega who is a clinical social worker with experience in community development, healthcare, social worker, and child protection. Her most recent experience has been working at the IWK Health Center as a clinical social worker. Balaki is a co-founder of Generation One Leadership Initiative, a community organization dedicated to connecting families of African descent to the education of their children and ensuring that education remains culturally relevant for families of African descent. Palaki is also a sessional instructor at Dalhousie's University School of Social Worker. She values her community commitments and regularly volunteers on many boards and committees. Palaki has enjoyed being an advisory council member of the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the Status of Women. She is a member of the Board of Examiners of the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers, member of the Board of Directors of the Be the Peace Institute, and she, is also, and she also sits on the steering committee of Alexa Madonna Institute for Women, Gender, and social justice. 
And um, finally, myself. So as Kaija mentioned, I'm Winnie Grant. I'm the proud mother of two beautiful African Nova Scotian women, Kai Asia and Kastiva. I enjoy um, spending time with my two-year-old grandson and is patiently awaiting um, my granddaughter. Winnie holds the position of Executive Director of Inclusion, Diversity and Community Relations Division with the Department of Community Services, and I am an adjunct professor with the School of Social Work. I've attained my bachelor's and master's degrees at Dalhousie University, where my master's thesis was entitled The Evolution of African Consciousness, The Effects of Racism on Africans in the Diaspora. I have completed um, also a master's of education and life lifelong learning with an Afrocentric focus on policy development at Mount St. Vincent, and I'm an active member of the Association of Black Social Workers. In addition to being a licensed um, social worker with the College of um, social workers. I mentor social workers in supporting them and getting their licensure. Finally, um, I'm a big sister to a little guy through the Big Brothers Big Sisters Association, and I continue to work hard to employ an Afrocentric theoretical perspective and a critical race analysis in the work that I do, um, which is in my teaching and also um, my day-to-day -day work and reflecting on lived experiences. So um, this is the lineup for those who will be speaking this evening. Thanks so much, Mrs. Grant. Um, so the first person um, who we're going to have um, is Afolake. Unfortunately, she could not be here today, but she was very determined and very honored to um, be at this event. So she recorded something. So I'm just going to play it. Stay with me here. Uh, sorry, one minute. Should be playing. Maybe what we'll do is we'll go on to Dorisa and I'll try to see if I can figure out the technical difficulties that I'm having. So we'll go on to Dorisa, that's okay. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. It is my it is my pleasure to be a part of this evening as we celebrate Social Work Month, especially recognizing and celebrating the important work of Black pioneers in social work across Canada. It is also humbling that this event is a rite of passage as we focus on the importance of passing this torch to the next generations who will carry on and build on the great work of our pioneers. Reflecting on chapter three of Afrocentric Social Work, which is aptly entitled Social Work Pioneers, it dawned on me that I have been exposed to and, how, and now have an understanding of the similar but different stories and experiences of African Canadian social workers across our nation. Some of the similarities I've discovered were around lived experiences drawing from childhood and youth experiences shaped by segregation and anti-Black racism. It is equally fascinating to see how these experiences have become a part of a collective identity in the respective communities where they grew up. It is also interesting to see how these experiences and community identity impacted such things as outward migration, to pursue education and employment opportunities. For many of these pioneers, these experiences have shaped out to become an identity of resistance and resilience against racialized oppression. These experiences over time have also transformed into mechanisms for helping to break down barriers for other people of African descent across Canada. From their understanding of social work values, these pioneers have come to see that through the value system promoted within their families and communities, social working already existed as an unrecognized practice as a part of their upbringing. Unfortunately, this reality often goes acknowledged, 
by larger society due to power imbalance, limited access, inadequate resources, and lack of opportunities. What also resonated with me is the experiences of obtaining a social work degree, where in some cases there were they were the only black student in their classes and what that experience must have felt like. Something I can also relate to. It is never easy being in classes where race comes up as a point of conversation and everyone remains silent. Having those uncomfortable conversations in a classroom setting for students who are white is often a struggle due to the associated shame and guilt of being descendants of European colonizers and settlers. Unfortunately, this form of silence is a form of racial microaggression, as at the end of the day, it only further perpetuates anti-Black racism. I mean, if you're not willing to talk about it as a social work, worker in training, how are you going to be able to become an advocate and an ally? Often as a Black person, I feel it is my responsibility to start these conversations. My hope is that someday others will be able to work with their discomfort and join the conversation in spite of it. A noticeable difference to highlight from the chapter is that not all of the pioneers experienced overt racism and discrimination through their education. And so, instead, some had better experiences where they felt challenged to think and be creative. I can also relate to some of the struggles they face, juggling parenthood, employment, and community work, because that's where I am currently in my journey. It is not easy going to school part-time, being a parent, working full-time, and being a part of those doing community work. In spite of this, I feel that it is my responsibility to be the best I can be as a mother and a community member striving to help others build capacity to encourage self-determination and promote self-governance for all community members. Upon completing my first degree in 2014 in sociology, I felt the need to gain experience working in my community and across other Black communities here in Nova Scotia. This has inspired me to take up social work and thank you to the pioneers. We, we may be having a bandwidth. We may be having a bandwidth issue. I wonder if, if people turn off their cameras. I think if only put the camera on when we're speaking. I wonder if people turn off the camera. Thank you. Thank you. We we didn't hear the last of what. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't hear the last of what. Going on. I don't know if you can hear us, but we couldn't really hear the last piece. It was kind of breaking up. I can't really hear you now. Okay, you couldn't hear the last piece for me? Yeah, it was kind of breaking up, I think, because maybe you're- Pardon me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but it's a, yeah, it's a little choppy. So I don't know if you heard me, but we couldn't hear the last piece. Okay, so hold on a second here. So did you hear in spite of this, I felt I feel that it is my responsibility um, to be the best I can be as a mother and a community member striving to help others to build capacity, to encourage self-determination and to promote self-governance for all community members. Upon completing my first degree in 2014 in social work, I felt that I needed to gain experience working in my community and across other black communities. This has inspired me to take up social work. Thank you to the pioneers who have paved the road for me. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so next, I'm going to get Alex to see if she can um, share her video for um, the video that I was trying to share that I unfortunately could not share.
Kai, can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Just let me know. Okay. Yeah. You can play it now. Please. Thank you. Oh, but we can't really hear it. So I think Alex, if you, did you choose share sound when you hit? Let me unmute myself and see if that helps. Okay. In community development, healthcare, social work, child protection, and social work education. I started my social work career uh, almost nine years ago. And my most recent experience has been working at the IWK Health Center as a clinical social worker. I am incredibly honored to be invited by Senator Dr. Wanda Bernard and the Association of Black Social Workers to talk about the impact of elder social workers, also known as pioneers, on my social work career. In preparing for my testimonial, I read chapter three of the Afrocentric Social Work text titled Social Work Pioneers. This chapter, authored by Wamsley, Etsy, and Bernard, is based on the biographies of 15 African Canadian social work pioneers. It describes their contributions to professional and community life, the challenges they face, and their strategies for change. They highlighted that the Association of Black Social Workers formed in 1979 by four women is an example of community-based volunteer organization that has struggled to provide social services in Nova Scotia for over 45 years. As a Black immigrant woman, I have to say most of the stories in this chapter resonated with me, especially the part that talks about how the pioneers found their way to social work, education, and career. The saying, you can't be what you can't see, is true for all of us because we rely on stories and examples and leaders and role models, or in the purest basic form, images that inform us about who we are and what our potentials are. So what are the impact of social work pioneers on my career? Despite the experiences of anti-Black racism, discrimination, and other forms of oppression endured by these pioneers, one thing that stood out for me is how the pioneers' collective contribution to social services, community life, and politics paved the way for me and the next generation of Black social workers. I am in awe of the collective wisdom and impact of these members of, on, of the social work profession. Without, their, without these pioneers um, dedicating their lives to taking action against injustices and oppression, the landscape today would have been totally different. Additionally, when I was doing my Bachelor of Social Work degree, I had small children at the time and I was working full time, but I was well supported by elder social workers here in Halifax from my application process to my admission to the School of Social Work. Having social workers of African descent, such as Dr. Bernard, Ronke Taiwo, Winnie Benton, Christy Duru, as role models to look up to where social workers, where, where social work role models and professionals, you know, are still largely invisible has been great. Uh, like most social workers of African descent, I have been working from an Afri African centered worldview with my clients, but I haven't always had a framework or language for it. The Afrocentric theory and practical ways of working was first introduced to me by Dr. Bernard when I took her course dur when I, during my MSW. Her research and exploration of Afrocentric perspectives has helped to yield insights that are important for both theory and practical ways of working with individuals and families. Overall, the elder social workers oriented me to the social work profession and taught me to be proud of the social work profession. I stand on the shoulders of elder social workers who have gone before me and made it possible to be who and where I am today. I have survived in this profession through the support, love, and advice of social work mentors. And like those before me, I too strive to lead as I climb, and I also hope to be the change that I want to see in this world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex, for sharing that. Um, and we wanna thank um, Afolake for sharing her video as well. Um, so I'm gonna go next. Um, so after reading chapter three of the Afrocentric Social Work book, um, I learned something very valuable that I didn't really realize until then. 
Um, so I learned that the theme of our event, um, ironically, passing the torch is something that has been instilled in me um, as a young child by my parents. So it all started about when I was about, I think, nine or 10. Um, and my mom would take me and my sister to the ABSW meetings. Now, I was, I was very young, um, so I, you know, I didn't really understand too much of what was going on at the meetings, but I really enjoyed taking the time to be around, um, you know, strong, inspiring Black women who now, you know, today I'll call my aunties. Um, and also, it was just really good to get out um, and get to enjoy time and spend time with folks who looked like me. Um, so in saying that, um, I didn't really think I was going to be a social worker. I knew I loved helping people, um, but because my mom was a social worker, in my head at, at a young age, I thought I, I, I can't copy her, right? I have to do something different. Um, so I did my rec therapy degree um, and then somehow do my social work pl placement uh, or my rec therapy placement, social work, um, came back to me and I was inspired by a social worker at my placement and applied and got in. Um, so my journey of becoming or going through the BSW program, I remember I was so excited at first um, because I was starting something new and I was finally, like I had a strong passion that this was what I was, like I was really happy. I had a strong passion that this is what I was going to do. But unfortunately, um, had a negative experience in a sense um, because I experienced a lot of racism and dis discrimination from my white classmates, um, which really affected me in um, a lot of different ways, um, a lot of negative ways. But, you know, I think looking back at it, um, I'm really blessed to be able to put in the coping mechanisms that I did. And, you know, despite, unfortunately, at one point, wanting to give up. Um, I'm very, very proud of myself because I stuck through it um, and seeked out support and was able to finish. Um, so with through that experience as well, I came to the realization um, that a lot of, like at the time when I was doing it, which I think is kind of still the same today, um, there's a lot more white students than black students. So I remember um, thinking to myself like, I was really worried because unfortunately the students that I had been with, I was thinking like, these are the students who are going to, you know, be working with folks who look like me. Um, and that was also another really strong motivation factor that in which I really found my voice in that degree and really said, you know, what I'm going to do is, you know, despite this reality, um, I'm gonna push through and I'm going to advocate for meaningful change um, to make sure what I experienced in the school didn't continue. Um, so yeah, and I also wanted to take the time to recognize the, AB, the ABSW members who really helped support me through that time. I remember I was a student member um, and I was, as I said, I was struggling, but you know, I would go to the meetings and the members would really give me the floor to really explain what I was going through and really helped me, um, you know, put in practice what was going on, but more importantly, supported me in a way um, to help me get through it, which was really good. Um, and um, it's too many people to kind of mention, but I will forever be grateful to all of those women. Um, next, uh, the unique part about being a social worker as well as that, like I mentioned, um, my mom is a social worker. Um, so I think for being a social worker, I was really, being a social worker and having my mom there to support me um, was really, really amazing. Um, like, you know, just thinking about it, I, I, I get tears to my eyes because my mom um, was there through everything um, and supported me through everything. We kind of joke and say, my mom will say that I've been critically reflecting, which is something we do a lot in social work um, ever since I was able to talk and able to really understand. Because not only mom would probably say that I was nosy, which kind of am, but I also would really ask critical questions really about why. And I think that's another reason really why I was drawn to social work 
Um, and I think one of the other unique things is that, like I said, my mom's a social worker, I'm a social worker, and my sister is studying to be a social worker. So we're going to have three social workers soon to be in the family. Um, and just the whole experience of all, all of us coming together and having meaningful conversations and helping each other has just been really great. And it's really brought us together, which I'm very thankful for. Um, so moving on, um, I have so much respect for the social work pioneers who paved the way within the social work field um, and how they advocated for meaningful change. They were all trailblazers in the field. Um, and it's just amazing of what they were able to accomplish despite some of the obstacles that they faced and they went through. Um, and that's another key thing that motivates me to keep going and not give up despite the racism, oppression and discrimination that I continue to face in our society and also in the field. Um, from organizing this event, it's been such a pleasure and an honor to get to talk to the pioneers. Um, you know, I had a really good conversation with, with Miss Dorothy Wills um, and just talking to her and how nice she was and how, you know, just the stories that she was able to tell me on the phone just really brought to light how amazing, you know, this event is to commem commemorate um, the pioneers um, and just how much you can learn from them, which is really amazing. Um, and lastly, what I'll say is that I feel for me personally, I feel that out of respect, it is our role as social workers within this generation to really continue the legacy of our social work pioneers. Um, and it is our role as new social workers or upcoming social workers within this generation to really step up and receive the torch that our pioneers and our elders are giving us. Therefore, we can allow this amazing legacy to continue which is something I plan to do personally in the future within my future social work practice. And I feel that I'm currently doing right now, given my experience and given how I was raised by my parents. So thank you very much. And next we'll move on to our next speaker, Mrs. Grant. All right. So, um... Kaye just told most of my story. It's, um, I guess, which is really interesting because I guess we not only do folks say that we sound alike, but we're beginning to think alike. So here we go. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this um, amazing panel. I um, have read the book um, several times, actually, and continue to read it. I use it in my class. Um, for my child welfare students. I've also um, used it as part of the teaching for our executive team, um, also for my team at work as well. And we go through it as a way of um, developing an understanding, a deeper understanding of grassroots social work from an Afrocentric perspective. And so as was mentioned, I'm the executive director for the inclusion, diversity and community relations with Department of Community Services. And in preparation for tonight, reading this, um, rereading this chapter again, it really, um, you know, the history that was outlined was really helpful to kind of ground the work, but also it, um, you know, as Kaija and Teresa had talked about, it really still resembles the experiences that we experience um, in the field and in education. So, you know, my first thought was, wow, and it immediately took me back to the book um, that ABSW has put together for fighting for change and that we're still fighting for change. And, um, you know, the educational experience for me um, was similar to what was indicated by Jerisa and Kaisha. But more importantly, when I read the stories of the pioneers, um, for me, I didn't want to be a social worker. And part of the reason I didn't want to be a social worker is because of our lived experiences. Nobody like social workers and social workers within our community um, or the, our experience as an African Nova Scotia community with social workers has not been positive. And so part of my, as much as I tried to navigate away from social work, I was constantly drawn towards social work. And so um, being drawn there and beginning to work there, the commitment for me was to make a change. How can I make this change for our community? How can we create change so that our experiences as an African Nova Scotia community is better? And so one of the pieces of work that, um, you know, I found myself in terms of 
when I began my social work uh, career and education, um, I also had the luxury because when I entered the school, um, previous African Nova Scotian students were raising the issue that there's no African Nova Scotian or African content in the classroom. And so they began to pave the way. And so what happened is that that content became in the school, but when it was in the school, nobody really knew how to do it. So it was an article that was put in the class uh, curriculum. And I remember actually pregnant with Kayesia and um, having this moment in the master's class and thinking, I'm reading the same article, but nobody is raising anything about an Afrocentric approach. So when it came to my turn to talk, I said, can you guys turn to page, you know, say 59 and can somebody read the top of that page? I just need to check in to make sure that I'm reading the same article that you guys are reading because nobody talked about an Afrocentric epistemology and that's what the article was about. And really what that says is that the article is there. Um, we're responding to what folks are asking, but we don't know how to deliver. And so um, that was sort of the beginning part of the pioneers, folks who were in the program before me, providing that opportunity. But fast going backwards, when I was in my BSW, I remember hearing about ABSW. And, um, you know, folks at the school were saying, well, do you know, you know, ABSW, are you connected with ABSW? And I said, what is this ABSW? And much like what Kaija says, it really was the foundation for my social work practice. I can tell you that I did my first um, field placement with um, ABSW. And it was that field placement that, sorry, my second field placement. And it was that field placement that really springboarded me into a master's program that springboarded me into the idea of uh, my master's thesis because I was surrounded by folks who looked like me, thought like me, supported me, um, and we would have rich conversations about African Nova Scotia community and it was a safe place that we could go and have conversations about what we were experiencing without judgment. And much like um, what was already said, these were folks who were mentors um, to me, who had the interests of the community. And the story of how ABSW began is a story that I think has helped me to build that level of confidence. So for example, you know, hearing about ABSW starting with four women and sounding that they had an army behind them whenever they went and talked places was the empowerment that I took away. Every time that I would go and speak, I would speak as if I, um, and still to this day, you know, I speak as if I have a whole, army with me because not only do I have ABSW as a support, but I have the ancestors and I have the future generation that we're here to do the, the um, work for. And so one of the uh, other pieces is the wisdom that, came, that comes from ABSW that um, creates that sense of community pride that not only addresses um, the community's needs, but really advocates for the community's needs and is able to give voice to the needs of our African Nova Scotia community and is doing that through the work that I have been able to um, sort of collaborate with ABSW through the Department of Community Services, but also within our Department of Community Services, there are, you know, when um, I think it might have been Teresa that talked about making sure that we are lifting as we climb, the importance of making sure that we internally um, are talking about ABSW, but also mentoring social workers that are moving forward so that we can go into the community to create more interest about being social workers. And so I would say that without the pioneers that have come before um, and have really solidified the work of the Association of Black Social Workers, our involvement and the support that those pioneers continue to give us as we work in the field, we would not be able to do the work that we're currently doing. And so the work that I do by operating from an Afrocentric perspective is work that has been championed by the Association of Black Social Workers. And previously, as was you know, indicated in the chapter, the pioneer work that has happened um, with the, within our church, within the community, but now we have a name that's for it. So we identified as an Afrocentric approach. So there's lots of lessons that have been learned from not just that chapter, but from the whole book and from the stories that are uh, indicated throughout the book and the experiences that have been able to help pave the way 
for and give voice to folks of African descent. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much to all the speakers that spoke today. Um, your words were very informative and very insightful, and I appreciate you taking the time um, out of your busy schedules to do this. Um, so next, I'm going to attempt again to play a song by a local artist named Rini Smith, um, which relates to our topic. So let me just try it again. So I think it's going to work. So I'm going to play her song. I was told that I wouldn't make it I'm just wasting my time And all these dreams that I keep chasing I'm just out of my mind But I don't think that I can just let go Until I make it through I'll survive I'm not giving up on faith All my life I've been waiting for this day I will find I'm not going out that way I'll survive I'll survive Many times I thought that it was over And they were right all along But through every storm, I'm still standing Before anyone says anything, I have to explain my role in that video. <laughs> so for people who know me, you know I cannot sing. I was not invited to be part of the video to sing. I was invited to be the face of survival, the face of resilience. So I was asked to, I was asked to just be very stoic. So that's why I'm not moving. <laughs> Thanks for that, Thunder Bernard. Um, and actually, I was curious about well, that. Well, it was a great video. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
And it, it was a really amazing video. We're really, really grateful that Rini let us, um, gave us permission to show that because it really relates to, I think, a lot of the messages that we've been talking about and the purpose, really, of this event. So mm -hmm. um, we're able to come, but, you know, we are very, very, very um, thankful. So next, we're going to move um, on to the question and answer segment of the event. We are honored to have two pioneers um, who agreed to participate in this segment. Um, this is Dorothy Wills and Mr. George Johnston. Um, so we're gonna have Mrs. Grant moderate the question and answer feature, but before we get started, we just ask if, um, if you could raise your hand um, so that we don't have everyone speaking out at once. Um, and for folks who may not be able to speak their question, you can also write it in the chat and we'll also be looking at that. So Mrs. Grant, I'll give it over to you. Thank you again, Kaeja. So uh, currently there isn't um, any messages in the chat, so I will be monitoring that, but does anyone have any questions for our pioneers? And actually, before though, I apologize. It's Doctor. Sorry, sorry about that. Maxine. Yes, I wanted to ask um, Mr. Johnson um, his experience starting out as a social worker because we haven't heard much from the male perspective. All right, so did you hear? Yeah, right, so Max, right, so Maxine, you're asking that Mr. Johnson provide some um, input in terms of what his experience as there wasn't a male perspective Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That's correct. All right, Mr. Johnson, are you willing to unmute and share a little bit about your experience? There, sorry. Oh, there That's you are. okay. I'm not quite sure what the, the question is. I couldn't hear it all. Yes. So it wasn't necessarily a particular question. There was an interest in hearing um, about your experience as one of the pioneers. If you wanted to just provide just a little bit of insight in terms of your experience so that we can have a male perspective is what the uh, person was asking. Male perspective. <laughs> male perspective. For yeah. a social worker. <laughs> anyway, um, I came to Canada about 19... 66 as a young man. But in relation to social work in Canada, I always have trouble with the black social worker because there's so many of them and there's so many cultures. <laughs> so when you say um, culturally, uh, I've met a lot of social workers who are black but have no relation to the Africa at all. I also have met a lot of social workers who were born other 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 countries that's not related to Africa at all. And I also have met a lot of social workers from Africa that just came to Canada. So it's a lot of mix of social work. So my problem was if we say social worker, black social worker in Canada, it's a lot of a lot of them, they are, are really not all Africans. So I don't know what this forum is trying to relate, what the difference are. My experience difference is, is that if you approach, and I'm gonna talk from the indigenous people in this country point of view, because I work with a lot of them. And they see social workers as at the beginning, at taking kids away. Mm -hmm. That's an experience that is, I experienced as a black person, which was really different 
but how the government I work for deal, dealt with indigenous community. And the other piece about social work is having a different traditions. I come from a tribe. To my experience of a tribe is that you become very selfish about your tribe. So learning to get along with white social worker is something that when you are a tribal person, it's very difficult to do. But because you're in Canada, you have to learn how to do that without worrying about having a different culture, or having different orientation. So to answer the question, my experience as a black social worker is difficult in the sense that because my experience didn't just involve social work, uh, black social work. It has a lot to do with indigenous community, different cultures community, uh, Hindus community. And then the part that been, I could say is made me a better social worker is understanding the mix. The mix of traditions, the big mix of cultures, the mix of her heritages, and trying to decipher that from the experience I got from university or from my as a Kenyan young man. So the experience is very hard to say. My experience was this particular way. I look at it and my experience as such work has been welcoming people that come that doesn't look like me, welcoming people that look like me and showing them a way to look after themselves. The other piece about social work, a black social worker, is meeting with those people who have never run, in, never run into anybody who's black coming to their house. That was a huge difficulty to deal with sometimes when we started, when I started being a social worker in 1970s. So I don't know, my, both my boys are social workers and I do know that they have different experiences. So to, to summarize, I would say my ex experience as a social worker has been very rewarding in the sense that I get to learn a lot of cultures, especially family cultures, and then learn the assumptions that people have about culture and about how people behave in their own home. Uh, the first thing that I found, I found that was really interesting is introduction. When my wife um, was talking to me about an indigenous child, he was in high school and had a an Indian card that says yeah. that, that it's going to be expired. So the child who's an indigenous person is given a, as soon as they're born, they're given a card. A status card. But it has an expiry date in it. As a social worker, that hits you in such a really different way because you work for a government that has something like that to people that they actually can expire. So those are the kind of things you run as, as a social worker. I try to change those kind of attitude by confronting. You cannot have Indian affairs, I can't have things like expiry date for a child because they're going to get for time when they're going to read it and they want to. What happens if it expires? So those are issues that are dealt with as a social worker. And that's what I like about social work. You get to know families, you need to know their difficulties, and you, you are given the responsibility of trying to solve those, but with also respecting your own culture. I got two boys I'm very proud of. One is a social worker. And the other one is also a social worker, but they have a totally different perspective of looking at social work. Because when I, when I was a social worker, as a black person, it was very difficult to move up the ladder. 
now is no big deal. So I am very grateful that you, you're creating this process of getting those people from different cultures, especially Africa, to mix with those people with different cultures, especially for me, for indigenous people, and seeing that you can make a change. And that is Thank you. all I can say about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Tashani, you have your hand up. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Uh, can you guys hear me clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, pose the questions. It's been a great informative session, and I know it uh, somewhat piggybacks off of the uh, three weeks that we did to celebrate Afrocentric social work in February. Um, my question is, you know, there's a, a lot of great history um, in the Afrocentric social work book, which I'm excited uh, to receive. Um, it was one of the winners from February. Um, so I haven't had the chance to read it as yet, um, but definitely looking forward to it. Um, and I'm from Toronto and working here in Toronto with um, a few others. And um, we're trying to build some connections amongst our black and racialized social workers. And I've got family from uh, Nova Scotia, Africaville, so do know a bit of the history as well. Um, and, you know, we haven't heard enough from our own Black social workers um, influencing the education system, making those changes to social work um, curriculum. And I guess one of my questions really surrounds around how we continue to build uh, those connections across the country um, of Canada and building those connections across our Black communities or for racialized social workers such as myself and others. Um, and I think there's that unique opportunity and really just wanting to explore that maybe a bit further. Um, we want to be able to leverage the knowledge of our pioneers um, and continue to empower one another and motivate one another building those those bridges and I know um, the Association of Black Social Workers originally started uh, in Montreal and um, has predominantly focused in uh, the Nova Scotia area but looking to continue building that momentum and connection across, across the country. Um, I don't know if anybody's able to support with uh, kind of that guidance but as a, as a young social worker um, in the field and wanting to, to build those bridges. That's, that's something that I, I know I'm very passionate about and others that I, I, I am working with. Um, build up the coalition. Michelle, would you like to respond to that and maybe talk about um, ABSW and our attempt to extend across Canada? Or Senator Wanda? We, we have been, that's been a vision since we started. And the, when the Montreal group started, that was their vision to have a national association. It's never uh, taken root, but I think some things are happening now. There's a group in Alberta, a group of about 35, um, Black social workers who come together. And just on Saturday of last week, a group of folks, social workers and community workers hosted by CASW and ABSW, uh, there was an event on Saturday and they are looking to start an association in uh, Ottawa. There's a group that's been meeting in Toronto. Um, I'm not sure I haven't heard from them in a while. The Nova Scotia group is absolutely open to supporting the development of other groups across the country because as you've heard this evening from everyone who's spoken, who's had a connection with ABSW, it's been really clear that that organization has provided such a solid um, type of support for people. So. So yes, I think, are you the person that reached out to my office today? Okay, so we're, we're on it. We're on it. We've, got, we've got you, we've got you. <laughs> Thank you. 
And I, I'll just put a plug, but Beverly Jones is one of the members that is hurting as well. So there's several of us who are following all of our, you know, our Black social worker and wanting, wanting to build that community connection um, because there's definitely a need and, and we know there's not enough information out there. Um, from our perspective in our community. So um, you know, it's just such an exciting time and opportunity to really continue to leverage the knowledge. And we have a lot of oral history, but getting that in writing is so critical and important to really continue to build that sort of foundation. So thank you, Dr. Thomas Bernard. So before, thank you so much, Rev. Before we get um, move on, just want to ask if folks aren't speaking, if they wouldn't mind muting, because there is some background noise and I'm trying to, trying to mute folks, um, but I'm still hearing it. So if folks wouldn't mind doing that, just because it's unfortunately hard to hear. And mom, there's some questions in the chat. I don't know. There was one question early on um, about getting more resources about, yeah, will there be any more resources available to learn more about the pioneers? Um, so I did respond to that. Um, maybe you missed that daughter, um, but there is another uh, question that is from Camille. Um, and the question is for any of the panelists uh, or pioneers, how do we disrupt and dismantle anti-Black racism, social regulations, especially at the MSW level? I found that social work regulations discriminates against black and marginalized communities. Anyone want to, and maybe just a continuation. Um, Camille also says, do you think it will take legislative change for ABSW to be nationalized? So that's two, two questions. So Camille, if I could just maybe ask for a bit of clarification. Are you asking about um, disrupt and dismantle the um, MSW program or are you talking about work at an MSW level? Sorry, um, work at an uh, MSW level, I find that for social workers because sometimes that's the be all and end all um, to, get, to get to practice in Canada. Um, and looking at it from a historical perspective, how historically MSW has always been a more kind of elitist in some ways and how it um, discriminates against people of color and marginalized folks um, because of the, the requirements, as well as you know that with MSW, you don't have to have a DSW to go into that, to go to MSW, however, it can be challenging for folks who don't have the DSW and who have to do two years, um, two years into the program. So that means that you're probably working part-time if you're a single mom, it's really hard um, to really meet all the requirements for the program. So when people say that there's a lack of black professors in social work, sometimes I look, is that a reason why where, you know, you know black folks can't get in to get their MSW because of the requirements? Um, and when you look historically where the regulations started, it started a long time ago and nothing has not been changed. So that's what I'm getting at, more kind of legislative kind of um, change um, in order for us to dismantle and disrupt anti-Black racism. So I'm not sure if I made sense there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that um, one of the pieces that I just want to sort of highlight in terms around disrupting anti-Black racism um, in my role, um, we have been working closely with the School of Social Work, as well as other community partners around establishing a um, Afrocentric BSW program. And so we recognize that before folks actually can get into the BSW, there's a need for them to, or MSW, there's a need for them to have a BSW. And so we recognize some of the barriers um, for folks to get into the program. And so we have been promoting uh, or working towards finding funding for that uh, program to begin. Um, in addition to that, we have been successful in going through Senate to get um, prior learning assessment to be uh, considered for some of the folks to uh, get into the program if they don't have the um, 
the liberal arts electives of, that they require because again th those are some of the barriers in the education system um you know and i can just share my own because when i went through high school um and i think this is again a piece that was in the in the chapter when i went through high school i was directed towards a three-year business course and so i took the three -year business course um, but when it came time to apply for university going as a mature student um, i was told that i didn't have a grade 12. And so the, luckily I was a mature student so that I didn't have to go back and to do that. But had I, you know, in a couple of years old, I would have had to go back to do grade 10, 11 and 12 uh, all over again. So, you know, there are barriers. We recognize that those barriers are there and we're working towards um, eliminating some of those barriers. So when you're talking about legislation, I just sort of want to go back um, to that. And I think that what I would encourage folks to do, not to necessarily wait um, and I think this is the value of being connected to an association such as ABSW because in my undergrad I was able to draw on the wisdom from the social workers that are consistently like with ABSW and so I was able to find my voice through the support of those mentors and so um, you know do we need to have an MSW in order to raise critical issues no, I think the bigger piece is that we really need to have a critical lens so that we're able to, to make those challenges. Now, recognizing that making those challenges, there's risk associated with that as well, right? And so it's about how do we build the level of confidence across the social work or even across community, right? And I think it's about how do we need to, one, have a level of consciousness for ourselves in order to be able to move the agenda forward. And, you know, again, I would say that in anything that we do and what I've learned, again, you know, from my involvement with ABSW is around strategy. How do we develop a strategy and how do we look for those supports to support us in developing that strategy? And so, again, I think you need to surround yourself with folks who will continue to support you and lift you as you move forward. I hope that was helpful. It was. Um, just one more thing, Dr. Grant. I'm so sorry. Um, so I'm in Toronto and I, um, you know, CYW, CYC, now I'm doing my MSW and I also have um, a master's of education. Anyways, when I'm talking to folks like white social workers um, or in the board that I work for, I cannot refer to myself as a social worker. And mm -hmm. it goes back to black women historically from the colored women's club historically been left out of this profession right so that's where i am doing some research to determine is it what i can do to disrupt or dismantle up more up the rigor the law side of stuff i don't know right so that's why i pose that question because it's really hard when, but i'm doing the work i am a social worker absolutely me i'm not right yeah and so, you know, I go back to what the pioneers have done, like, you know, in our churches, they were the ones, they weren't social workers necessarily, but they were doing the social work. And so social work sometimes is within that title. But again, if you have the strategy and the knowledge, um, and I see all kinds of hands that are up, so I'm not sure if those, if Wanda and, and uh, Dr. S, if you want to respond to this question. Um, yes, okay, so other wisdom coming at you. Go ahead, David. I, 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 I'm not going oh. to weigh into that question, no. Oh, okay. So David- I have, I have another question. question. So in response to the question, um, I think that we need multiple pathways to get into the MSW program. Uh, and I use myself for an example. So I don't have a BSW, but fortunately I, um, well, my grades were, 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 were strong enough as an undergraduate, and I also have another master's degree. But I applied to the two-year program at U of T, and uh, from an educational perspective, that was one of the best experiences I had uh, in 1980. And one of the reasons why it was a great experience, because the year that I got admitted was the year that the program admitted uh, the highest number of black students. And, and there, were, there, were, there were seven of us. And, um, and we, formed our own, we formed our own community. So I, I think that there's, there, has, there should be multiple pathways 
in terms of being able to um, do an MSW program. And at, and at the PhD level, um, there seems to be an emphasis on, on, um, on people who have done an MSW degree and haven't completed a master's thesis. But once again, um, I'm not sure that that's always, uh, that those individuals are always the best applicants. And once again, I used myself. So I, I didn't do a, well, at U of T, there was no thesis option because a year before I got into the program, they did away with the thesis option because it was taking people, well, they say you could do a thesis in one year, but it was taking people two or three years. So at, at the end of the day, I think that there's a need for multiple pathways, both in the MSW and if one is interested in pursuing a, a PhD education. Thank you for that. Um, I'll go to Senator and then Joanne, Stephen, and then we have a question in the chat. Uh, just very briefly to Camille, there are some, there are more pathways now than ever before. So if you'd want to reach out, we can certainly make some contacts for you. I, I have a question for Dr. Wills, actually. She was, Dr. Wills was one of my mentors. And uh, Dr. Wills, you were one of the, I think, first people that I met with a, with a PhD who was working in social work, social work education. And so I wondered, as you were listening to people tonight, especially those who spoke about current experiences of racism in the education, in social work education, did any of what you heard tonight sort of resonate with you? Did any of that sit with you um, as you've reflected back, as you were listening tonight, were you reflecting back to your time as a dean, your time as a social work? Uh, social worker, social work professor, any of that. I, I would just like to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, I don't even know where to begin. <clears throat> when, I, when I went to McGill University School of Social Work, there were two of us in the class of about 250 people. And all of the professors were Jewish. And most of the 250 students were Jewish. And I am from the Caribbean. And I remember very vividly, every time I would ask a question in class, one of the Jewish students would say, what Dorothy is trying to say is, until one day I got mad enough, I pounded the desk and I said, if it takes me 20 words to say what you can say in 10, I reserve the right to say my 20 words because my tuition fees have been paid and they're as good as yours. You, you had to stand up and be counted. You had to make sure that you knew what you were doing and that you were doing all the right things because nobody was going to support you. There were two blacks in the whole class and then they said only one of us, they let it be known that only one black would graduate at a time. And I thought, I, I spoke to the, the other black lady and I said to her, listen, they want to see two blacks fighting like they used to make two slaves fight during slavery. Let's not give them a show. And if I looked around in the class and I didn't see her present, and I was making my notes, I would slip some carbon paper in between my sheets so that I could make a set of notes, exactly what I was making for myself, for her. But at the second year, first second semester of the second year, they called her into the office and they told her that she dressed so seductively that she would have too much of an impact on the clients so they had to ask her to withdraw. So Dorothy ended up being the one who graduated. Um, 
to, to, to face those kinds of barriers, because there were indeed barriers um, and very low expectations of us. It was amazing. I chose to write a thesis because I wanted to work on my own and be my boss, my own boss. And um, I remember my thesis advisor telling me, I'm amazed at the way you write and the things that you have addressed in your thesis. And I just looked at it and I said, thank you. Because you have to be, you had to learn to be polite, pleasant. If not, you were the angry black woman and you had a chip on your shoulder and you had to fight that all the way through. Not only from the, your fellow students, but you fought that from the professors as well. When I was in a position to do something, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember getting a phone call from Ganawagi. That's the Native People's Reserve in, near Montreal. And they asked me if I would send three or four of the graduates of my program to, for, for, to be interviewed for their drug addiction program and their step-by-step -step early childhood education program. And I said, the, answer, the short answer is yes, I can send my students, but before I commit students to you, I would like to ask you, why aren't you working in your drug addiction program and your step-by-step -step program? And they said, well, it's not easy. We live on the reserve. And after a certain time of night, not even a taxi will take you to the reserve. So they were not able to further their education. I said, what if I came on campus and gave you your education on the reserve? Well, how would that feel? And they said, oh, we would love that. Well, when I spoke to the academic dean about that, he said to me, Dorothy, we don't have any money for that and we're not going to do that because I said, okay, just before you get, get on with your because, suppose I could get volunteers to go on the reserve and teach. How would that sit? He says, okay, we will see what happens. Well, I went on the reserve on Radio Guanawagi and I told them all about the social work program and I told them all about what they could do with it when they got their, their degree. Um, and make a long story short, I started the program on the Ganawagi Reserve with 33 applicants. And the first day of classes, I went nuts. I said, listen, I take myself seriously. I want you to know that you need to take yourself seriously. I don't accept late papers. If you have a late paper, keep it and just write zero on it. And you can put your initials if you want. I said, and when you come, you will find the door of the classroom closed at six because the classes begin at six. If you come and the door is closed, it means you've, uh, you've absolved your, yourself from being in this class this day. I said, and I don't take excuses because if you give me an excuse, I'm, giving, I'm telling you that it's okay to weave the best story and the best story, which may or may not be true, would get the grade. I don't grade those stories. So don't ask me for an extension. Don't be late. And we have a reputation, I said. We have a reputation in common. Black people don't know time. And you might think you don't know time. I know time. I learn time. So I expect you on time. And the academic dean told me, Dorothy, you're crazy. We're not, we have no funding for this. He said, I promise you, I'll never ask you for a penny. I shamed the, the faculty into volunteering to teach one course at a time on the reserve. I taught many of the courses on the reserve myself and I would prompt them. They would tell me about the residential school. And I would tell them, if you're carrying so much baggage, no wonder you don't get too far. Sometimes you have to put down the baggage and run by yourself and forget the baggage that you left behind. And they would say to me, how did you manage? 
I said, well, I came from the Caribbean. I was 15 years old. I went to Mount St. Vincent University. They gave me an opportunity. I went to McGill. They gave me an opportunity. And I made the most of the opportunity, but I never lost myself in the process. I'm a Pan-Africanist. And I said, all Black people need to pull together if we want to get anywhere. We can't divide ourselves between native born and foreign born and African born and African being more precious than those born in the diaspora. That's nonsense. We all have to be together in this. And then I pointed out to them, they need to be to together as well. So make a long story short, out of the 33 applicants, we graduated 30. And the, the college was amazed because I prepared the graduation ceremony with the people in mind. So we started the graduation with the indigenous people saying their prayer of thanksgiving. One of the elders came, said the prayer of thanksgiving for the opening of the graduation ceremony. Then they poured their libation and did their thing, and that was fine. And all the higher ups at the college were on the platform, the, the director general, the academic dean, the director of continuing education, they all were sitting on the platform. But I was sitting in the back with my class. And after the valedictorian spoke, she says, she put down the official valedictorian address and she reverted to her, her own way of speaking. And she says, I don't know where you guys come from. We never saw you not once on the reserve, but now you're standing on the stage taking all the credit. And Dorothy was the one that was with us morning, noon and night and made us believe in ourselves. So, you know, if you have confidence in yourself and what you're doing, you can spread the word and you have to recognize that black people are not a monolithic lob. We come from different parts of the world. We speak different languages. We have different religions. The only thing that really unites us is our black skin. And we have to acknowledge that and we have to cater to all our brothers and sisters who work in the profession and recognize that we, we are our brother's keeper. We have to help each other. We have to support each other. And if we cannot do that, we're in big trouble. We, and we shouldn't be social workers in the first place because social work is the most malign profession. Everybody can call themselves a social worker. They, they think charity is social work. They have all kinds of ideas about our profession. But you know something? We ought to know what we stand for, how we stand, why we stand, where we stand, and put that hand out and stretch that hand to each other to make sure that the human chain is strong and cannot be broken. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, story with us and the experiences with us. Very powerful. Um, we were scheduled to finish at nine. There are three more questions. And so I'm just wondering if folks are willing to stay. Well, now we have four questions. Um, if we're willing to stay in order to uh, finish up those questions. And um, if you are, I'll start with Joanne. Can you hear me? Yes. I think you're muted, Joanne. Oh, am I done? Am I still yep. muted? No, nope, okay. you're good now. Okay. 
Sorry about that. I was trying to put on my camera, but somehow something went off. My name is Joanne. I'm a social worker in Brandon, Manitoba. Um, and I'm just so glad that I am on this platform. I stumbled across this because I was looking for um, something to fill up my uh, continuing competence hours. So I was like, oh, I never knew there was an association for Black social workers. So forgive my ignorance um, with a lot of things. It's just I'm overwhelmed and I'm thankful. So the question that I have is if the ABSW has like a list of Black social workers across Canada that young social workers like myself can access um, for mentorship or to just ask questions in my field uh, placement. I was the only Black social worker. Um, right now we have three social workers in my family. Um, but I'm just wondering, is there a list that someone like me could access to reach out to people um, all across Canada? Thanks. The short answer to that is no, we don't. Unfortunately, um, we don't. But who says we shouldn't start one? Yay, I'm all for starting one. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good um, suggestion. So, Steve? Sorry, okay. Uh, well, I just want to first of all, I just want to say congratulations to ABSW, a long time coming. Uh, and um, really apologize for being late here. And I will be on YouTube. And, and I want to congratulate. Uh, um, the uh, pioneers for speaking and, and uh, uh, like Winnie just said, uh, what a story, uh, Miss uh, uh, Dorothy, uh, uh, the elders, it's always awesome to hear the elders uh, speak and, um, and, and, and I wish we would uh, start listening uh, to the elders uh, working together. Uh, I represent an uh, organization, nonprofit, I hear the, uh, the uh, Black Wall Street of Atlantic Canada and uh, we're a new organization formed in 2019. And so you'll be hearing more about us, but uh, the whole premise of the uh, uh, the uh, Black Wall Street came out of the Tulsa, Oklahoma situation that happened a uh, number of years ago, but um, really uh, excited uh, uh, to bring forth the, the, this event. I'm glad I'm on this event also. Uh, I was kind of forced by my daughter to be here, but uh, um, so she was one of the uh, passing the torches. So I wanted to ask a question uh, to the pioneers that if if we are passing the torch and just briefly and uh, um, how do we because uh, I heard a lot of things about um, uh, uh, anti-racism and, and that racism still exists uh, the George Floyd situation that happened in the United States which affected you know the whole world um, Canada um, I'm from Philly originally but being in Canada for over 20 years um, I have seen that now, the first time Prime Minister uh, Trudeau acknowledged that racism did it, does exist. And so uh, my question uh, is probably twofold is that, so to the pioneers, how do we encourage the young people uh, to be free uh, to talk about the issues? I heard the young lady talk about the barriers and being a disruptor. So I want to just hear from the pioneers on uh, just maybe a couple of points around how do we encourage the young people? Obviously, this event tonight will encourage them, but how do we encourage the young people to actually uh, to look at legislation and then also to speak very bluntly about what I call, I was talking to a buddy of mine from Boston College today, that's where I went to school, and as a student athlete, that I use the word sinister. So it's very... And, and social workers, you understand, I, I have a little bit of social work background. Uh, Dr. Uh, Senator um, um, uh, Wanda Bernard was one of my uh, profs there. Uh, good to see her. Uh, but I think it's sinister what has happened to Blacks and um, uh, uh, Israelites and, and, and uh, Caribbeans and Blacks in the diaspora. And I do agree with working together. So how do we um, uh, support uh, uh, the, the uh, passing of the torch uh, and the courage that our young people are going to need uh, to be able to push forward, forward the agenda uh, to, to make um, not only disrupting change, but change that really says that, that we can do this now. Um, and so hopefully, uh, I don't, hopefully that question is pretty clear from the, to the pioneers. How do we uh, encourage our, uh, our, uh, our 
our young people uh, we're passing the torch to to move to move uh, effectively uh, through this uh, climate. Do we have someone who would like to respond? David? So great questions, uh, Steve. Uh, I don't know if you remember me, I, I met you many years ago when I was, in, when I was visiting uh, Halifax. Um, okay. So I guess I would consider myself now a social work pioneer uh, because I'm retired. And um, when we started writing the chapter, I wasn't eligible, but uh, it took us probably eight or nine years to, to write the chapter. And so in response to what the younger generation should do, so I think participating in forums like this are helpful, but we, but we just can't leave it at participating in these forums. And so I think young people either as, as individuals, uh, or uh, collectivities such as ABSW or even collectivities within the classroom where there are multiple black students uh, that they need to, to speak up um, and share uh, what's working well in their courses, what's working, uh, but as well, what's not working well in the courses. And then from a, a programmatic level, um, begin to ask the questions in terms of where is the content related to uh, Afrocentric social work. Uh, and, and not only in a specialized course that Dr. Bernard has, ha, has given since 1999, but because I've, I've been doing a lot of thinking and uh, the problem with with the course that, that Dr. Bernard has offered, uh, and she's offered it at, at Carleton, she's offered it at Dalhousie, and this year to my uh, female college offered uh, a similar course because they use Dr. Bernard's course outline. But I, I would say that, that, um, that that's a hit and miss because uh, only those students who are interested in the subject matter will take these courses. And I would say that, 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 uh, that we have to move along and make these courses, these, this course mandatory. But I, I like what, what Winnie said because um, I think we have to move on and just and just go beyond off in one course. And I think if we if we if we are really serious about uh, educating our, our our social workers about Afrocentric social work theory, practice, research, it has to become more than just one course because one course you can't do everything. And I think that there's been a proliferation of, of, of content that would warrant more than one course. That's my response to that particular question that you asked, that you posed. Thank you for that response. Um, so I'll go to the question that is um, in the chat. And it says, what is the step Can forward? You, may, may, may I please? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, while I agree with all that you said about the courses and whatnot, I think it begins with the individual. The individual has to be clear about who they are, what they stand for, and how they stand for it. The, the individual also has to be careful how they speak up and when they speak up because you run the risk of being called the angry black woman with a chip on your shoulder. 
and then nobody listens, no one, not even your black sisters and brothers because they don't want to be associated with you once you get that label. So you have to be very careful how you speak up, when you speak up, and, and I'll give you a little example. I went to an international conference in British Columbia and I got there the night before and I went to the desk and asked for my, my documents. And all I said was, good evening, please may I have the documents for wills. And this little white man looked at me and said, oh, I see Dr. Wills couldn't come. So he, he sent you, are you his secretary? And I said, please give me the documents. And he gave them to me and I said, thank you, have a nice evening. And I left. But the next morning we had a tour de tab and it was an international tour de tab. There were people from South Africa, England, all over the world. And um, they asked for somebody who had just renewed a technology program. And I had just renewed my respiratory and anesthesia technology program. So they asked me how I did it because I ended up raising $45,000 for new equipment for my program. So I was explaining that to them. And this little man, white man from last night was sitting there and he was <laughs> looking at me and he went from white to pink to purple in his face. Oh, yes. And then as the, uh, as the session ended, he ran after me and he says, Dr. Wills, Dr. Wills, I owe you an apology. Now, uh, when I said little man, I, I mean little man, I'm five foot 11. So I pulled myself up to my foot height. I looked down on him and I said, what on earth for? And he said, well, what I said to you last night wasn't very nice. I said, it didn't make me who you thought I was. I have a nice day and I walked away. Now that had more of an effect than if I had protested, if I had told him off. And so we have to be careful how we speak, when we speak, because although they might say we're black with a chip on our shoulder, they have a designation for us that we have to dispel before we can get through to them. So it, 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 a lot rests on the individual's shoulder how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, and why you're going to do it. Again, thank you so much for that wisdom. Thank you, thank you. Can I just throw in two, two little comments? I think the book is a wonderful tool. So we certainly should be encouraging the reading of that. But I also want to pick up a, on a comment that Kai Benton made earlier when she was speaking. And I think Steve, you may have missed this you'll catch it when you watch the video. Yes. She, she said something very powerful. She said, step up and receive the torch. And I want to repeat that. I want to elevate that because we need more young people prepared to step up and receive the torch. And, we, and as elders, we need to be ready to step aside. And I'm certainly one of those elders who's ready to step aside. And Kai, I just wanted to say, I'm so proud of you tonight as you've moderated this. I wanted to say that publicly to you. Step up, receive the torch, and you have done that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Senator Bernard. That means a lot, thank you. So that segues into our final question. That says, what is the step forward? I mean, where must current generations focus more on to keep mentoring one another and advance Afrocentric social work to influence social work curriculum? And I think Dr. Wills um, and I think David also sort of alluded to that in some sense where they talked about it's the individual and we need to know what we stand for as we are um, moving through the schools of social work. But I think in addition to that, we need to come alongside and mentor um, and, and recognize that we're not always gonna be there forever. So I, I say that with my colleague, um, Ann Simmons, who um, did have her hand up at one point, but you know, Ann and I talk about this often. We are probably the seniors uh, mm -hmm. in the Department of Community Services who are looking to retire. 
And mm -hmm. um, as we move through, as Senator Wanda talked about moving out of the way, it's critical that we lift as we climb. And mm -hmm. so we have been um, pushing for an anti-Black racism strategy within Department of Community Services. We have been mentoring our colleagues, um, both Black and white. We have been ensuring that there are um, upward mobility for our social workers and staff of African descent so that that Afrocentric approach can continue on. And I think, you know, as, a, as we're talking about in curriculum, we need to be able to find our voice, right? And sometimes it's those critical situations that force us to find our voice. And I think as Dr. Will said, is that we need to be intentional about how we use it so that all of those pervasive thoughts that they have towards us that we're not buying into that and that we are able to uh, stand up and stand proud as we speak our truth. So we have gone over time for 21 minutes. Um, I am going to pass it back to our moderator and um, she will Thank you. close out. Thank you. So the last, um, the last segment of the event will be um, our closing remarks, and Senator Bernard has graciously agreed, I believe, to do that. So I'll pass it over to you. Before I do that, I, um, the co-authors of the chapter are all on the line, and I want to give each of them a moment, if they'd like, to take one to um, just share any reflections you may want to share on the evening. We'll start with you, Dr. Est. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bernard, for the opportunity to speak. And first of all, I have to admit that I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion um, this afternoon. Um, it was lively, it was insightful, it was meaningful, and I think that the session advanced uh, all of our work in relation to the importance of not only hearing from our pioneers, because what they had to say informed, not only informed us, but influences us even today. But the second thought that, the second thought that, that uh, has been running through my head is, the chapter itself, and uh, for members of the audience, uh, we didn't, so Dr. Bernard and our other colleague, Dr. Chris Walmsley, when we started this, this project, we didn't have any money. <laughs> we didn't have a cent, uh, so, uh, but we stuck with it because uh, we realized the, and even, and it's been accentuated today by the gracious comments that all of you have made in relation to their narratives that are, that, that we presented in the chapter. But we had a vision, well, we had a dream, <laughs> we had a vision, and then we took it upon ourselves to, to, actualize what we had, at least uh, the vision of, of, of the work. Uh, and I say that because I know that we presented a version of, a much early version of our work at the CASW conference in 2000. So I think that we probably started this project in because, um, probably 2012, and the idea is probably 2011. So um, I just want to thank my two colleagues, co-authors, Dr. Wamsley and Dr. Bernard, for for pursuing this piece of work, because now after hearing the comments from the from the participants. Um, it made it worth whatever it took us to do to put this chapter together. So thank you very much. And I'll pass the microphone to my dear colleague, 
Dr. Chris Walmsley. If he's still here. Um, thanks, Dr. Est. Um, hopefully I'm unmuted, am I? Yes, you are, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, Chris. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so uh, I'll be very brief. Um, it's been a real honor to be part of this, this project. Um, it has been a long running project, as Dave mentioned, maybe the longest running project in my entire career, but probably the one I've learned the most from. Um, I think as I've shared with Wanda and Dave from time to time, I've been in, in and around social work circles since 1969, and I was in retirement before I learned anything about the contribution of African Canadians to social work in this country. And, it, and, bef and I was in retirement before I learned anything about African Canadian history. Uh, so all through my career, um, no workshops, no articles, no guest speakers, the one exception being Rosemary Brown, who I had the privilege of campaigning for a few times and having her come to a class that I taught in Northern Manitoba. Um, but I didn't know most of what was written in the first third of that chapter. I, I had to learn that. And I'm pretty sure every other white social worker in the field today uh, has no knowledge of African Canadian history. I just want to acknowledge that I believe there's two other pioneers who are from British Columbia who are on this Zoom call. They probably haven't identified themselves, but through communication, I believe they're here and listening. And I believe there's also the children of two other British Columbia pioneers who told me they're going to be on the Zoom call. So I just want everybody to know um, to know that. But it it has been uh, quite a learning process, and it's something that I continue to learn, and it's something that I see so much importance being shared through the wider social work circles. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. I want to extend my thanks to everyone who's here and everyone who's been able to stay. We've kept you a whole half hour longer. That's very late for those of us in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for the deep listening. And I think I want to repeat a couple of words I heard earlier this evening. Dr. Mulling said that we must ensure that no one ever erases us, our history ever again. So we need to, part of that is, is about showing up. Part of that is about writing and telling our stories and documenting our work. And part of that's also about working with our allies to make sure that our history is being told and our history becomes part of the mainstream history. It was a line in Demini's poem. She said, or two lines I want to repeat. Black social work pioneers, holders of history who chose to care. I want to say to the pioneers and the, the, the ancestors of the pioneers, because you chose to care, we've survived. We have survived. We have not allowed to have our hope stolen from us because you chose to care. We are because you were, and we are all very, very grateful to you for all that you've given.
to us. So thank you. Back to you, Kai Benton. <laughs> All right, so I believe that concludes um, the night. Um, you know, I echo thank you so much again for staying 30 minutes later and for just being here, participating. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties, but we got it working. So, and we were able to finish off strong. And I think that speaks to a lot. So I hope wherever you are, um, you have a great night. Um, and yeah. Let's... Thanks for moderating. You did a great job. So greatly Thank appreciate you. it. Great job. Great job, Kai. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to CASW, to uh, Sally. And Alex, yes. And Alex. Yes. And for people, people talked about uh, advocacy this evening. I just, if you're, if you're available tomorrow at noon, I'm doing a session with the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers on advocacy. I think if you go to their website, you can probably figure out how to register. Don't, don't ask me to put anything in the chat. I can't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you do go to the NSCSW right under events, it should probably be there. So that's an event they're doing to close out Social Work Month on Social Work Advocacy. What time is that, Wanda? 12 to 1 Atlantic. It'd be early for you folks of West. Yeah. <laughs> but we stayed up late for you tonight. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a medical appointment at 9.15. I think they'll probably record it and make it available. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. This has been amazing. Thanks to yeah, thank everyone you. who spoke tonight as well. All right. See you, everyone. Right. Okay. Well done. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good Thank night. you so much, Dr. Wills. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>